Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good evening. It's my pleasure to call to order the 515 regular City Council meeting of June 26, 2024. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Arias. Here. Councilmember Weir. Councilmember Smith. I am here. Councilmember Freeman. Here. Councilmember Gray. Here. Councilmember Core. Here. Thank you. Welcome to all of you. Again, we, we apologize for the delay in the start. We have an interpreter present tonight for Spanish language, and I'll now invite the interpreter to give instructions for those who might need to use the service. You're on this side. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Estefanía y tenemos Fernando de Lingüística. Vamos a proveer interpretación en español. Si es que ocupan un dispositivo, por favor, de levantar la mano. Good afternoon, my name is Estefanía. We have Fernando. We're with Lingüística and we'll be offering simultaneous interpretation. If anyone needs a device, please invite people to raise their hand or to go up there for a device. Thank you. Thank you. And for the benefit of our interpreter, please pace yourself and speak clearly into the microphone during your comments, and this will help our interpreter to clearly translate your message. At this time, Time, we have the pleasure of having Reverend Hector Lopez, who is the pastor of St. Philip the Apostle Church in Bakersfield. He'll offer the invocation. We're just so grateful for your outreach to those who have challenges in terms of food insecurity. And I know that members of your congregants have been collecting food through Catholic Charities and through the Gleaners. Thank you so much, Pastor, for that. Following the invocation, Erica de la Cruz, who is a city fellow and a graduate of CSU Bakersfield, will lead us in the pledge. She's a fellow with our city manager's office. She recently graduated from CSUB, majoring in business administration, concentration in small business management, where she served under the Associated Students, Inc., Go Runners, and she plans to pursue a master's in business administration and work for the city of Bakersfield. Would you all please stand? Thank you, Mayor, for the opportunity to, the invitation to lead the uh, invocation at this evening's meeting. It's an honor to be with all of you. I invite us to pray. Loving and provident God, we come before you this evening with grateful hearts, seeking your wisdom and guidance as we gather for this city council meeting. You have bestowed many gifts and blessings upon our city. You have placed us here in the midst of a rich heritage a variety of cultures, and a wide diversity of people we call our friends and neighbors. We give you thanks for this opportunity to serve the residents of Bakersfield in the building up of a strong, healthy, and flourishing community for everyone, one in which every person can grow, succeed, and be happy. Grant the members of the council the wisdom to make decisions that are just and fair for all members of our city. Give us the courage to face the challenges ahead Fill us with compassion to understand the needs of our neighbors. And above all, inspire us to work together with open hearts and minds, always striving for greater unity and cooperation. Lord God, we ask that your peace might reign in our hearts and in our streets. Help us to build a place of belonging where every member feels welcome, valued, and respected. May the strength of this community Shine forth in the way we treat the weakest among us. Lead us to greater solidarity as we share our goals, hopes, and dreams. Give us the patience to listen to one another and the strength to overcome our differences. Guide us in our efforts to work together in collaboration, always seeking the, com the common good. Look upon us with kindness and bless the work we do. We ask all of this placing our trust in your providence and care for each of us. For you live and reign forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor. Erica. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Erica. You may be seated. Here are a few guidelines to help our meeting run smoothly. We request that you turn off your phones. Please be courteous in the use of cameras and videos. For safety reasons and as a courtesy to others, no signs are allowed in the council chamber or in the lobby. Applause is allowed during the presentations portion of the meeting, but not during the other portions of the meeting. Everyone in attendance is expected to adhere to the rules of decorum established by resolution of the city council. Failure to abide by the city's rules of decorum, including any bis disruptive behavior that interferes with our ability to have an orderly and efficient meeting, prevents the city council from conducting the business of the city. Consider this a first warning to everyone in attendance that conduct that disrupts the meeting may result in your removal from the meeting and or the chambers being cleared. Behavior that disrupts the meeting includes repetitive statements, shouting, interrupting staff or presenters during the meeting, speaking out of turn, outbursts from the audience, and surpassing the time limit. Madam Clerk, next item. Public statements. Thank you. In keeping with the council's new resolution, public statements are now received at different times, depending on the item. I will call on the city clerk to call for public statements at the appropriate time, so please listen carefully for the correct time to speak. If you wish to make a public speak statement, please fill out a public speaker card and place it in the tray on the counter next to the speaker's podium. We ask that you mark whether you're here to speak on an item listed on tonight's agenda or on a matter not on the agenda. Speakers who do not identify a specific agenda item will be presumed speakers for the non-agenda public statements. If you're here to speak on an item not listed on the meeting agenda, you will be called first to speak. Statements are given a two-minute time limit. Per speaker, 20 minutes total for all non-agenda item public statements. If you're here to speak on an item listed on the agenda, I will call for you at a later time, so please listen carefully. If public statements become disruptive and I have to clear the chambers to regain orderly, uh, to regain order of the meeting, you will be called in one at a time to provide your public statement when your item is called. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items not on the agenda? Merica, we've received nine speaker cards for items not on tonight's agenda. The first three public speakers will be Florence Marshall Darrow, Susan Colstead, and Johnny Olaguez. Thank you. And Ms. Marshall? Hi. Welcome. Please introduce Hi. yourself. My name is Florence Marshall Darrow, and I work for Golden Empire Transit. And I'm here to talk about um, our transit board. And um, I would like, um, I'm not happy ha with our leadership of the board that you guys have elected. Um, these past few years, we've been having problems with them, and a few of them have been in office for quite a number of years. Uh, one of them's been in for 10 years, and plus she has, I think, another five more years listed on this, or at least four. And I think that I'm, I'm asking you guys, the ones that you've elected, if you guys can reconsider of having them, having them replaced, because um, I'm not happy with their leadership, with the things that have recently been happening there. Um, that's, that's about it. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Thanks. Next speaker, please. Susan Colstead. And following her will be Johnny. So Johnny, if you can make your way to the front row, that would be helpful. Save some time. 
Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hi. My name is Susan Kolstad. My husband, James Kolstad, has been working for GET for 22 and a half years, and they recently rehired the new CEO. Everybody was pleased with him. He's trying to be innovative and put new things out there, and then they go and fire him. And there have been drivers that have said that with Karen King, they didn't get much interaction from her for open door policy or suggestions, et cetera, whereas Mr. Tree has been quite the opposite. And everybody has well received, has been very receptive from Mr. Tree, and he has done a lot in trying to push get forward and further in the 21st century and make it more efficient. And even a couple of the things that he had suggested, the board actually even adopted last night. So what's the problem? They have not established, they have not discussed, said anything about it. And I'm asking the same thing as Florence, that you remove the people that you appointed. Please. Thank you. Next speaker. Johnny, followed by Yolanda Gaeta Heyman, followed by Francis Rubio. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Johnny Olagas. Um, so one question. I've been looking into what paperwork and what qualifications it takes to run for city council. I noticed that the website has little to no information. I myself have figured it out. I called. Um, would it be possible to update that for future candidates or people who may be interested in running for local office? Uh, information is power, and with no information, we are not promoting a knowledgeable, engaged, or inclusive community. So that's what I'm here to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, Council Member Arias. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if I could just ask staff to take a look at that. Um, I myself have also looked for the same exact information and have, and have struggled to find that basic information on the elections process and um, that information relevant to potential candidates. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Yolanda Gaeta Heyman. I am also a coach operator at Golden Empire Transit. I, myself and coworkers spoke to the Kern County Board of Supervisors yesterday at the 2 p.m. meeting where they engaged and voiced their concern over the Get Board's action of initially terminating our CEO, Michael Tree, June 17th. At last night's Get Board meeting, the two county appointees abstained from voting to fire Mr. Tree. It was the two city appointees and the at-large member who voted to fire him. Therefore, there appears to be a split on the board, and we wonder why. Cindy Parra, a city appointee, is the board chair. At last night's get board meeting, drivers voiced for the reinstatement of Michael Tree as our CEO, but felt the board showed no empathy GET will now return to a state of turmoil, and you seriously need to question the current state of the board's leadership. How effective has Ms. Parra been guiding the transit district? In 2014, the city council removed both of its GET appointees due to complaints. Now, a decade later, your appointees are under criticism again. Keeping Cindy Parra and Carlos Bello on the GET board does not appear to be improving the transit district's image. Are they acting in the best interest of the city? We shouldn't have to come here to bother you with the transit district problems, but we will bring our concerns to you, the people we vote into office, if action is not taken. The transit district should be governed effectively so city council does not have to intervene. We are asking for Cindy Parra and Carlos Bello to resign as board of directors at Golden Empire Transit District, or we request that city council act on replacing both immediately. Your time is we up. Will Can you continue? bring your comments to a close, please? Okay. Thank you. you can go and finish the last sentence. We will continue to fight for what we believe is in the best interest of, of all of us and our community. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Francis Rubio, followed by Kev, followed by Carmen. 
Welcome, please introduce yourself. Frances Rubio. I'm here today as an employee here for 30 plus years to address some issues of Golden Empire Transit employees. There's some several issues. One, there appears to be an ongoing problem with the appointees that the city council has selected as board members. In 2014, the city council removed both its appointees as a result of a strike that occurred mounting to public dissatisfaction with these new routes systems that were implemented during the fall of 2012. The city council's goal was to replace these appointees with more responsive people who would work to solve get problems. But unfortunately, these two replacements have only caused more problems over the past decade. Number two, your appointees have been on the get board for 10 years, plenty of time to solve problems and move the district forward. They have been given enough time, but nothing is better. You need to seriously think about how much longer you want these people to be on the board. Is it, a, is it good to have people, have these people on the board that long? especially when they no longer they serve and the problems are just worse, are getting worse. So I ask you for the city council to address these issues. We need city council to support on these issue, ongoing problems that us, the employees, are tired of facing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rubio. Next speaker, please. Kev, followed by Carmen, followed by Lisa Smith. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hello, my comment today is for the community. So we can acknowledge how the city tends to operate, that we the people come here to advocate for improving the quality of life, that we ask for things because there are actual <laughs> issues in the community that need to be addressed, and that at the same time, the city seemingly works against that that as a community we would ask for things like measures to ensure we mitigate climate change, yet the city will cut down trees a couple blocks from here, ones that would have cooled the area and provided hundreds of people of shade during notoriously hot summers, that for a time peaceful Palestinian protesters came here asking for a simple ceasefire resolution and they were met with intimidation, antagonization, and violence, that for years, people in this community have asked for police accountability and reform of a notoriously dangerous police force, and yet the city is still giving them hundreds of millions of dollars, passing recent resolutions to give them multiple types of surveillance software, ammunition surpluses, and power expansion, or the, or the other issues that we bring here. They either get pushed aside, unaddressed, or forgotten. So we shouldn't glamorize any of the city's actions, whatever they take, because if we were poor or homeless, we wouldn't even be able to rely on them to treat us like humans. So please remember this when our needs as a community aren't met, that when the summers are too hot, when the water infrastructure fails, or when the things we want to see funded aren't funded properly because they have other priorities. Free Palestine. Next speaker, please. Carmen, followed by Lisa Smith, followed by Cecilia. Welcome, please introduce yourself. I notice some of you are snapping and that is disrupting the meeting, so I'm gonna ask you to please stop. Carmen, go ahead. Hello, I'm here once again to ask the city council to pass a ceasefire resolution. I know that this will not stop the genocide in Gaza, but it will show the people of Bakersfield where their city council stands on genocide, a genocide. <clears throat> it will show the city of Bakersfield that you are not okay with seeing children starved and blown to pieces. It will show that you do not support the United States funding the murder of over 40,000 people. Please consider looking into the ceasefire resolution that was given to you months ago. <clears throat> The city of Bakersfield told Parks and Rec to cut down the two trees on 21st and I Street. 
These trees provided shade and oxygen to our community, and I'm wondering why they were cut down. I'm hoping it wasn't to get rid of the homeless who would hang out there and rest under the shade. I am recommending that fruit trees be planted there in place and that the city of Bakersfield stop cutting down healthy trees. I'm also here in support of the eviction prevention program and urge you all to support our community and allocate funds to this program because everyone deserves a home, including our undocumented community, and to also be treated with respect by their landlords. I'm also here to urge you to look into Patty Gray's son, Christian Gray, the man assaulting people in front of City Hall. Please do not let Christian Gray think it's okay to assault people because his mom is on the city council. Also, I'm urging a thorough investigation into why 27-year-old Brandon Elliott Gabriel Flores was hit and killed by police officer Julian Garcia. The, the patrol car did not have their lights or sirens on when Brandon was hit. The officers must alert the public through the use of their lights and sirens as indicated in California Vehicle Code 21055. Why does the community have to start a GoFundMe to pay for expenses instead of having it come out of police funding? A program you could take some funding from is the organized retail theft program that the state awarded the Bakersfield Police Department. Carmen, six your time point, is up. Go ahead and bring okay, your comments to a close. $6.2 million to prevent and respond to organized theft, motor vehicle accessory th theft. Um, they were responding to a motor vehicle theft, and this would be a very appropriate way to allocate funds to victims of the police department. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Lisa Smith, followed by Cecilia. Welcome. Please introduce yourself, and we will have staff help you. Can somebody help Ms. Smith turn that Can on, I have please? My time reset. Yes, we will. Thank you. Can somebody just help her with the? Uh... I should know how oh, to do this. You have I'm it over a teacher, here. right? But I'm on vacation, I guess. It's on. Thank you. All right, Can, welcome. Is, is it okay? Would you? My name is Lisa Smith, and I am here to speak to you tonight about my friend, Stephanie Gatlin, who is a sometimes contributing writer to the Bakersfield Californian and is a longtime teacher at East High School. And she's a department chair working at KHSD this week or this summer. She was near my home, which is one of the 22 county islands within Metro Bakersfield. So it happened near my home, but it could affect any of your wards. When she went to a Starbucks and a, a person was screaming in the parking lot, she went around and went to, took care of her business to get her breakfast, came back out. The woman stood between her and the car, raised a gun, pointed to her head, and said, I'm going to and kill you, and called her something and pulled the trigger. Stephanie was lucky. It was either a replica gun or it jammed. But when I talked to her later, she told me that BPD informed her the area is so dangerous they don't even go out there anymore. And part of that is because behavioral health has moved into the same building as Kern County Probation on Stockdale and Stein, on New Stein. Right next to the recycle center, in the same parking lot with the smoke shop, a block away from four other mental health facilities, and a block from that, three other smoke shops that were existing together on the same corner. We run into this everywhere because the city and the county bump into each other and one facility doesn't know what the other one's doing. Jeff Flores' office that I know of when I spoke to them did not know that this facility was there. So my concern is this, we have 22 islands bumping into the city. We have businesses moving in without setback requirements by any, any ordinance except for like porno theaters from schools. We do not need these businesses dumped on us. Please do something to keep these businesses from all going into one area and to work with the county so that you all know what each other is doing. Thank you. Thank you. I have her post of the event, and I would like to leave these packets sure. for you. Sure. You can just leave them right there, and we'll get them. The city clerk will. Yes. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Cecilia. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. My name is Cecilia Marcial. I am a perinatal nurse in the city of Bakersfield, representing only myself. 
And I am here because I am appalled by your silence and your enabling of conflict between BPD against your constituents. How many peace breakers do you need to feel safe? How many of us do you have to criminalize? You are enforcing state violence against us so that we will be silent. But jail is not worse than genocide. You are criminalizing our words while you remain complicit in ethnic cleansing, while you enable violence against the people you claim to represent. Just like the police in this building, you are abusing your power because you feel disrespected. Well, I don't respect you. Does that mean that I, need, that I deserve to be treated as subhuman? While you faint at words, the settler colonial state of Israel is deliberately targeting healthcare workers and life-supporting infrastructure. You remain silent as they kill my colleagues and murder our children. While you threaten us with violence if we disrupt your important decisions, if your statements against the apartheid state do not matter, then why not make them? You are enabling white supremacy. I invite you to move away from the ties of supporting an apartheid regime equivalent to Nazi Germany, and then maybe your constituents will respect you. That is all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, is that the conclusion for the items not on the agenda? That is correct, Mayor. Thank you. We'll now move to public statements listed on, oh, I'm sorry. Where is your, did you sign? Sorry. Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Mayor. Uh, my button's not cooperating with me this um, Can you check the technology, please? So uh, I wanted to uh, first comment on Ms. Smith's um, remarks. Um, that experience obviously is pretty jarring. If, if um, city staff can reach out and if we can look into what were those comments made by the police officer, that seems a little odd to me. Um, and then also I think there is value to figure out some coordination. And, and also I think underneath it all, um, there are some county pockets within that area that are problematic. And I think uh, you know our larger goal to annex a lot of those unincorporated areas uh, is ultimately um, a way to resolve some of this uh, conflict in terms of jurisdiction questions. Um, but certainly we want to make sure that we get to the most acute issue right now related to the safety of that particular area. And uh, I'd appreciate it if um, we can, if staff can work with Ms. Smith to identify um, uh, both the situation, but then also address some of those chronic issues in the area. Um, and then the other comment um, I wanted to clarify regarding the street trees uh, and the removal. Um, this was a project that was planned from my understanding, uh, for quite some time. Uh, we're, we're removing a lot of the um, pretty antiquated uh, uh, planters within downtown, um, and we're set to upgrade a lot of the infrastructure in downtown, particularly around 18th and 19th Street. And I know Mr. Anthony is here. If you can come up. And it was my understanding that we worked with an arborist to see how we could save those trees um, and we did that work. Can you just explain for the public? Because I know this has been a question. Mr. Anthony. Sure, for the record, Rick Anthony, Director of Recreation and Parks. Uh, you are correct, this has been a, a process, uh, a project that's been in progress for quite some time. Um, I actually went out myself with the arborist to see if there was a way that we could replant the trees or repurpose the trees, but the fact of the matter, because they were in the raised planters, majority of their root balls would not be able to be salvaged or being able to kept intact. So it is unfortunate at this time that we got to this, but those were the facts of the matter. And also, we plan to replace yes. trees. So we plan to replant mature exactly. trees in the area. Every tree that was uh, taken out will be replaced, and we will choose the largest species, the most drought-tolerant species, and obviously the species that will provide that most shade. Right. And this, and this whole notion that somehow this is a strategy to, um, to remove homeless, I take exception to. We actually, I particularly advocate on behalf of making sure that we have additional resources for our unhoused folks, particularly in the heat. And if yeah. anyone who attended the housing and homelessness meeting yesterday, uh, that was a question that I raised in terms of what we do when we're responding to the unhoused. But I also want to just clarify and underscore Mr. Strackloose in our 
design of 18th and 19th Street of our improvement project along that corridor, it actually includes elements uh, including uh, street furniture. Is that correct? It does. Okay. So we actually will be enhancing the area for all of our citizens to find refuge under shade in downtown, correct? That's correct. That's okay. Fair. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Thank Anthony and Mr. Strackloos. We'll now move to the public statements listed under the agenda. If you're here to speak on items listed under consent calendar item seven, your time to speak is now. Again, each speaker is given a two minute time limit and each agenda item is listed, limited to 20 minutes total. The consent calendar as a whole constitutes one agenda item. If you're here to speak on hearing item 9A, or deferred business item 11A, now is not the time to speak. You'll be given an opportunity to speak when those items are called later in the meeting. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items listed on consent calendar item seven? Mayor Go, we've received one speaker card regarding consent calendar item seven, E7. And would you go ahead and call that speaker? Kev. Welcome, if you just wait until everybody exits. Thank you, welcome, go ahead. I'm here in solidarity with the many folks who have mobilized to see $2 million be put into the eviction prevention program. A program that will act as a buffer between renting and homelessness. A program that's guided by aiding people instead of making a profit. A program that helps people by assisting them instead of policing them. Which is why it not only needs to be properly funded but properly effective. If the program is not in good faith or if they don't have the resources necessary to assist everyone in the community, then and it won't be effective at helping the marginalized people who need it the most. GBLA will not be effective. The right to counsel programs deserves a chance to be effective, and it deserves the $2 million of funding it ought to have. I urge these things because it's the livelihoods and survival of community members, of human beings that are on the line. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kev, for those comments. I, I do agree with you. Uh, there are those vulnerable individuals who do deserve um, the services provided through this eviction protection. I think um, earlier this afternoon, we were able to have a conversation. And just to clarify, uh, Mr. Clegg, we are bringing this item back to housing and homelessness in three months' time to uh, review the status uh, and to monitor the progress of GBLA's work through this contract. That's correct. <clears throat> Both of this contract as well as um, considerations for other neighborhood stabilization yep. projects that we could pursue. Okay, and I, I do know that there's this question about $2 million. I'm, quite, I'm not quite sure how that was calculated and where that came from. Did that come from staff or from GBLA? It, it did not. Okay, and so we will have another opportunity to review the contract and that funding amount and how that, how GBLA is performing uh, both in three months and then also in subsequent, um, subsequent meetings, correct? Correct. So what I'd like to do is um, make a referral that we bring this item back in particular at mid-year. Um, so we talk about a mid-year budget um, and make it even a contingency item uh, for us to address should we need uh, additional resources uh, given the demand. Okay, and with that, I'll move uh, the consent calendar. You have a motion, please cast your votes. Uh, Mayor, prior yes. to the vote, um, if I can just announce that we pro provided a staff memorandum transmitting correspondence on a non-agenda item. Thank you. Go ahead and cast your votes.
Motion is approved with Council Member Weir absent. Thank you. And for the record, uh, the Vice Mayor did check ahead of time and none of the Council Members wish to pull any items for separate consideration. But thank you. Our next item is public hearings. Each side will be allowed 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes for all speakers per side. So it's important that you identify yourself, make your statement succinctly so others may speak. We'll hear statements from those opposed to staff's recommendation first, then we'll hear from those who would like to speak in favor of staff's recommendation. If there's testimony on both sides, each side will be allowed a five minute rebuttal. There's a clock on the TV screens behind me, which indicates 15 minutes. Please step to the microphone, identify yourself. And after 14 minutes, a yellow light will come on. At the end of 15 minutes, a red light will flash, indicating your time is up. Quickly end your statement. You may ask questions during your statement, but they won't be addressed until the public hearing is closed. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, give them to the clerk and she'll provide copies to the council. Please be courteous to others who wish to speak. Madam Clerk, please read the public hearing item. Public hearing to consider action plan amendment to HUD action plan fiscal years 2022 and 20, uh, 23 and 2023-24. Thank you, and Mr. Clegg. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Our Economic and Community Development Director, Ms. Byers, has a brief overview for this item. Ms. Byers. Thank you, Christian and City Council. So this item before you tonight has come, hold on, I'm, I messed with my computer. So the item before you tonight is a public hearing request based on our home funds. We're requesting a reallocation of those funding resources, um, specifically from two fiscal calendar years. Let me see. I love technology and yet I struggle with it daily. So basically, the items that we're requesting are from 22, 23 to reallocate some of the funding for the Let's Ring Senior Housing Project. It is 150 units uh, located in Ward 1. That project is up for some tax credits, and in order to be more competitive, there's some funding uh, reallocation that we are proposing. There's some funding from 22, 23 budget year, as well as from 23, 24. We have a second request for uh, um, an amendment, a substantial amendment for the uh, tenant-based rental assistance for CAPK to provide $1 million in tenant-based rental assistance. We did notice this agenda item and are requesting City Council approve these budget items. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Clegg? And at this time, hearing item 9A is open. Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation? Please come to the mic, identify yourself, and proceed. Seeing none, is there anyone who wishes to speak in support of staff's recommendation? Please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and return it to council for comment and action. Madam Clerk, can you activate the request button, please? All right, just signal to me if you would like to speak. Anybody? Comments? No comments? Uh, Vice Mayor? I move to approve the action plan amendment. You have a motion? Please cast your votes. Oh, right now, are you frozen? I'll just give her a minute to see whether. Motion is approved with Council Member Weir absent. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. 
Deferred business item 11A, fiscal year 2024-25 city budget. Item one, a resolution approving and adopting the operating capital improvement budgets for the city of Bakersfield for the fiscal year 2024-25. And number two, a resolution establishing the city of Bakersfield appropriations limit for fiscal year 2024-25. A staff memorandum has been provided transmitting correspondence regarding this item, and another staff memorandum was provided updating the salary schedule. Thank you. Before we begin, please note that if you're here to speak on deferred business item 11A, the city clerk will call for public statements after staff's presentation. Each speaker will be limited to two minutes, and there will be a 20-minute time limit per item. Mr. Clegg. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Just to provide <clears throat> some context uh, for this item, uh, over the last several months, we have had uh, workshops in particular related to the Public Safety Vital Services Tax through that oversight committee that uh, makes recommendations related to that funding source. Those were held in April. Uh, they made recommendations and, and uh, provided feedback that was provided to the City Council <coughs> at your last uh, meeting in the meeting packet. We also had a budget workshop for the city council uh, that covered uh, presentations from all departments uh, that uh, went through this information. Of course, those, uh, are, those workshops and meetings are also available to the public that may not have been able to attend those workshops uh, online through our um, uh, online portal that, that has our meeting agendas and, and meeting minutes and recorded meetings. And then at your last meeting, uh, we uh, had a public hearing to solicit community input uh, related to the budget. And what you have before you tonight is the final uh, budget uh, recommendation for adoption. Uh, next year's budget, again, just to set some uh, broad context that has been repeated in all of our workshops, that uh, we continue to see the economy be fairly flat overall. We have seen some modest increases in sales tax and property tax, uh, but not what we would expect in sales tax in a typical um, economic year uh, over year. And so our, also our um, cost of doing business has continued to increase due to inflation, general um, you know, cost increases for supplies and services. Uh, we've also had increases notably in our utilities as well as our liability costs, our insurance costs and risk mitigation costs are up by millions. Uh, we have also, I think it's fair to note, addressed um, some deferred um, market compensation adjustments in the last couple of years and that continues to uh, also affect next year's budget. But overall, with our costs going up and our revenues remaining flat, it means a tighter budget. And so we've had a very conservative approach to our budget for this coming year. Uh, we uh, ha have ad made very few additions to uh, employees or services. We actually reduced the public safety vital services tax ongoing um, operating expenditures by more than $3 million to make some space for programs that are of high strategic priority like including another $1.5 million in next year's budget for additional emergency shelter beds. Uh, we've also um, increased our capacity to address uh, chronically homeless uh, through intensive case management services. And then we've made some additions on the policing side for um, professional uh, employees non-sworn employees, but returning many sworn employees uh, to police work, as well as just continuing to professionalize uh, the administrative and, and other supports to uh, the police um, department. And we've also just added uh, two call takers to help with our homeless encampment uh, call center. Those are probably the most notable uh, additions. We have uh, capital projects also that address um, in large part our streets. We have $82 million that is going towards streets in this proposed budget. Um, we've been in a large catch up mode there. Modest uh, investments in ongoing park work. I can um, affirm to the community that we have done more than 30 park projects in the last four budget cycles, um, spending millions of dollars upgrading and, and um, addressing deferred maintenance in our parks, but this coming year, a little more modest investments to make sure we can do grant match funding for the uh, Martin Luther King Community Center renovation, 
as well as um, some other enhancements in parks throughout the city. Um, the full details, of course, are in the agenda packet. They're also online in our um, proposed uh, budget book. And uh, if I could just reflect over all um, our budget this year, we have a, a capital improvement project budget that is $172 million total. Uh, our um, overall budget is uh, just under $900 million um, across all funds, including enter our enterprise funds. Our general fund budget's now over $400 million. Um, but again, um, reflecting those highlights of um, the most strategic additions, our focus was on maintaining essential services, making st some strategic additions, and setting aside contingencies and reserves to ensure against uh, any potential econ further economic downturn in this coming year. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding deferred business item 11A? Mayor Go, uh, we have received one speaker card for um, Mr. Eddie Lane. Mr. Lane. Uh, Mayor Welcome. Go, I'm Eddie Lane. I, I thought I was going to be discussing the, the $2 million eviction prevention program. Am I at the right time, right place? You're, uh, you put down 11A. I'm, I may have made a mistake. I, I would argue that there, there it's a subset. The, the, this is a, you know, a budget item yeah. that uh, allocates resources. Mm -hmm. It's appropriate. Yeah. It's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Eddie Lane. I'm a longtime Bakersfield resident here to speak on behalf of the $2 million proposal for the eviction prevention program. I'm passing around two pictures. The first is of the denuding of all living vegetation between a portion of Truxton Lake and Truxton Avenue, creating a virtual moonscape. This picture was taken on March 27 of this year. The purported purpose, protect the water storage functions of the lake. However, four large water storage ponds west of Allen Road serve the very same purpose. They are not denuded of plant life. This unsightly scene is not necessary. As the Sierra Club has recommended on numerous occasions, there needs to be a written protocol regarding habitat protection along the Kern River and bodies of water, natural or man-made, such as Truxton Lake. The development of such a protocol was promised three years ago by then Water Resources Director Art Cianello and provided to the staff and the council many times, no follow-up. Particularly troublesome is the renewal of a contract with General Tree Service last year from 860,000 to 1.7 million. The first page of the contract is provided for your review. General Tree Services was responsible for what you see in this March 27 picture. However, City staff bulldozed the other side of Truxton Lake and destroyed habitat along the Kern River the same day. Cut and destroy. The second picture was taken June 2024, 2004, uh, just a few days ago, of trees trimmed at Jastro Park. What guidance from city staff was provided to General Tree when they hideously butchered those trees in what was once our Bakersfield Tree City? Aside from looks, there is virtually no shade for on hot days. Please stop this destruction of our limited native vegetation. Take the $1.7 million and put it into use for our vulnerable population. This program is $2 million for eviction prevention. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Madam Clerk, do we have other speakers? Mayor, go, we've received additional speaker cards. The following three uh, speaker cards were received. Uh, no, uh, no Garcia, Noe Garcia, Ashley De La Rosa, followed by Valerie Pinto. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hi. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Noe Garcia. <clears throat> I'm the Director of Civic Engagement with the Dolores Huerta Foundation, speaking here on behalf of Dolores Huerta and the organization. I'm here to urge and, and really thank the city for allocating $350,000 for the eviction prevention program. It's been a you know, huge battle by you know, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability and tenants as well. 
Uh, and so we're here to really, you know, urge that the city allocate more of that funding for the evic eviction protection program. Um, we're asking for $2 million to really fund this program and ensure that we can reduce the inflow of families into homelessness by protecting vulnerable tenants from, from eviction. We know that homelessness continues to increase each year, and we've seen those figures uh, just this year alone as well. And so we know that, you know, Preventing folks from losing their homes is a more humane and cost-effective way than having to help them rebuild their lives after they've become homeless. So I appreciate the motion to you know, review the, pro the program and its effectiveness, uh, but we are asking for more funding, $2 million of funding, and we're gonna continue to work with each of you all to find that funding and, and get more of that funding as soon as you all see how effective that program has continued to, been, to be. Um, so that's really what we're here to do. Uh, thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Next speaker, please. Ashley De La Rosa, followed by Valerie Pinto, followed by Vicky Granito. Good evening, council members. My name is Ashley De La Rosa. I am a member of the Kern County Young Democrats. I'm here, um, I just wanna share with you, when I was in fifth grade, I was actually houseless and I didn't know. As a child, as a child, you never understand why you're constantly moving, why you're having issues, and why these issues are never fixed. And so, you see, now I know what I didn't understand then. Landlords abuse low-income immigrants, people of color of families are vulnerable to evictions and vulnerable to residing in, in one home. We are experiencing a huge houseless crisis and the solutions you've presented thus far are really band-aid solutions that do not offer long-term and or for a longer to, term. It is necessary to fund important it is very important to, for you to fund the $2 million for eviction prevention programs. And the key word to this is prevention. If you provide the just $300,000, $350,000 for rental assistance, it's a one-time Band-Aid solution, and we're asking for long-term. We are asking for investments. And you, just for you to understand, the story I bring this to you today is because the 2,500 residents that are facing houselessness today in Bakersfield are not just adults. They're young children that are also suffering the burden that are being kicked out at a higher rate in suspensions in our Kern County schools. So if you're kicking them out of school and they have nowhere to go, and on top of that, they have no assistance, how are we providing and serving Bakersfield? And so today, if we really listen and believe the invocation of Father Hector, then you will be leaders and stand in solidarity with the community and provide for the most in need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Larissa. Next speaker, please. Okay, uh, before you start, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Delarosa, thank you so much for sharing your story and your personal testimonial. I, I really honor that, I really do, genuinely. And I, I do wanna communicate that, um, you know, eviction protection, I don't believe is a Band-Aid. I don't think that's what you're saying, but um, it's, it's also coupled with lots of other uh, prevention programs that we're trying to build out. And in fact, we do have a rental um, assistance program, emergency rental assistance program. And just, Mr. Clegg, if you will, uh, I know we had just a presentation at the 3.30 meeting, but for the benefit of those individuals who are here now uh, to speak on this particular issue, I think it's important that we communicate, uh, you know, to our constituents and to the public who, who care particularly about this issue, um, what exactly we're investing in in totality. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor, uh, Mayor and Council. So we have several programs that are currently uh, being resourced or pending, you know, to begin uh, that I can highlight as well as just say, express really quickly um, the actions that were recommended earlier this afternoon. So the city does fund uh, a fair housing program that helps uh, individuals that are facing discrimination based on a protected class as defined by the federal government um, that is through a contract through the uh, GBLA. We also have a home buyer assistance program. We have tenant-based re rental assistance that we've done not only through, of course, uh, the pandemic, uh, through large pass-through dollars from the federal government, but we also allocated more recently $700,000 to continue the rental assistance program. And then we allocated $1 million of um, uh, HUD, uh, Ho Housing and Urban Development federal entitlement dollars also to continue a tenant-based rental assistance program 
um, from our home funds. We actually just approved that tonight uh, on your council agenda. We uh, also are looking at $1.4 million uh, from the state HAP dollars um, as a set aside for youth home access. Uh, to address that, we have other uh, funding like emergency shelter grants and HOPWA funding uh, in smaller amounts but that help vulnerable populations uh, be housed. Uh, and then we did approve um, on the consent agenda the $350,000 to begin our eviction prevention program pilot. So th those are all, um, oh, and excuse me, we also have a home uh, weatherization and home repair programs that are funded through our entitlement dollars. And then also lastly, we've been able to acquire several million dollars for home weatherization and, and installation of solar through the Transformative Climate Communities Grant specifically to uh, low-income individuals in disadvantaged neighborhoods in Southeast Bakersfield. So those are programs that are currently in place. We acknowledge that there are many programs across a spectrum of prevention services and stabilization services that could be considered. And we committed uh, this afternoon uh, in our workshop to go and do research um, um, that takes into account our uh, draft housing element and recommendations in that our uh, affordable housing strategy that the city has adopted, also the regional uh, homeless collaborative action plan strategy has several recommendations. And we'll look at all of those recommendations from all three um, strategies, as well as uh, benchmark city research and other best practice research, gather data on this pilot um, and you know through this other research. And we uh, anticipate coming back to this council based on all of that data to be able to come back and talk about other potential programs that could include uh, substandard um, housing rehabilitation, uh, looking at how we leverage our community land trust to build different housing types, um, expansions of some of the existing programs, res residential facade improvement grants, um, and also looking closely at our land use policy adoption in coming years that, that helps uh, facilitate this kind of work. And so we're looking at a pretty broad spectrum of neighborhood stabilization programs beyond just eviction prevention. I appreciate that. And and one of the letters we received, I was reading, um, made a comment regarding their concern for the city's um, reduction in revenue or in um, reduction in uh, our allocation for uh, affordable housing. And um, you know, I, I think that's a legitimate concern. That's a concern in many of our conversations that I've expressed as well. Um, and so, I think one of the one of the ways in which I've sort of um, rationalized it, for lack of a better word, is that we still have these uh, unspent ARPA dollars that are allocated for affordable housing construction for our community land trust, and we still have um, some dollars in our affordable housing trust fund um, that are unspent. Um, so can, can you kind of, for, for the benefit of the public and for, from, for us on the dais, kind of explain staff's rationale for that recommendation? Um, yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. So <clears throat> a couple of different uh, perspectives. Uh, one, uh, it is accurate that we have um, more than eight million dollars. Uh, no, excuse me. We 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 had uh, spent um, one point four million dollars in the acquisition of a, a residential hotel motel. So we we now have um, you know six and a half million dollars, a little more than that, that's going into the community land trust. That's going to be uh, developing affordable housing units. Um, those are significant ARPA investments that are still pending. Uh, we also have received additional monies, uh, thankfully, in this last fiscal year from uh, what's called Home ARP. It's ARPA funding that is specific to affordable housing projects. And we received additional allocations, uh, I think $4 million of uh, overall Home ARP funding that has allowed us to fund several affordable housing projects that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, at the same time, uh, we also are looking at the housing and homeless assistance program funding from the state. Um, those funds have um, been hard fought every year through the state budget process, but we have HAP 5 monies and HAP 4 monies that are still not fully spent. 
and we are um, very thankful to see HAP 6 monies included in the, uh, the final state budget that we'll be able to use towards different projects. And then in addition to that, there is significant federal funding that's out there right now. And so we know that we need some local dollars that we can use as grant match. And we've actually been able to, in the example of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, we've allocated $5 million each year. And we've been able to go to the state and apply for matches to those uh, funds. And so in one year, we received a $2 million match. In another year, a $3 million match. And so we got another $5 million into our Affordable Housing Trust Fund by matching state funds. And so in a tight budget year, as we looked hard at um, the many competing interests, uh, we also are recommending a $2.5 million allocation to support the expansion of the Open Door Network shelter. And with that large project and some other uh, notable projects and some of these other funding sources, we did feel like the $3 million allocation in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund would allow us to still do many important projects, leverage other opportunities to you know, get federal dollars and, and we hope some state dollars, although much fewer state dollars available in this coming year. Um, to really maximize uh, the use of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund monies as much as we could. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have some comments to make, and I, I will hold those comments until the end of the public. Uh, comment period. Colleagues, we have a number of public who still wish to speak, so we'll come back to you at that point based on um, what we've set up. So, um, Madam Clerk, are there additional public speakers? We have about 14 minutes left, and are there more speaker cards than I have received at this point? We no. have eight more public speaker uh, cards for public speakers to go. Thank you. Okay, um, Madam Clerk, please call uh, Ms. Pinto. Sorry, thank you for waiting. No worries. Um, hello, dear City Council, City Staff, and Mayor Go. My name is Valerie Pinto, and I'm making a public comment on behalf of the Rapid Response Network of Kern. I asked the city to allocate $2 million in the 2024-2025 city budget for the eviction prevention program. Considering what's at stake, times are hard, and there are skyrocketing numbers of evictions across California. Now that COVID-era moratoria has expired, tenants need to know their rights and have an attorney present and guide them when facing an eviction or housing issue. Considering both of our bases, your constituents and our community members at Rapid Response Network of Kern, our majority working class populations, we need to look to Kern's most at risk of homelessness. Specifically, what both of our bases have in common consists of not only the working class, but primarily farm workers. Monterey, Fresno, and Kern counties have the largest number of farm workers in the state regardless of the population. Detached single family houses were the most common type of housing for California farm workers, roughly 57%, and about a third, 35%, lived in crowded dwellings. None of this is new to us. What is our concern is that our base of community members and local leaders involved in our rapid response network of Kern are out of work. Field workers are experiencing a shortage in agricultural work, and because of field workers, the Central Valley supplies about 25% of the nation's fruits, nuts, and other products. However, only 9% of, California, 9 of Californian farm workers lived in housing owned or administered by their current employer. All of this goes to show that your constituents are working, living paycheck to paycheck, and on top of that, do not have a stable means of a job, which affects their housing status exponentially so when there's a lack of legal resources to assist combating unlawful convictions. We must work together to ensure that tenants know their rights and have an attorney present and guide them when facing an eviction or housing issue. When the city invests in security and our budget asks to fund eviction preventions program, our base has one less thing to worry about. However, let's reframe the idea that this is just one issue the city cannot address because of all other countless issues. Because with 37% increase in homelessness in Kern County from last year, the biggest issue is inflow. The city must Ms. prioritize- Ms. Pinto, your time is up. Can you bring your comments to a close, please? Yes. Not only is it inhumane that hardworking folks are unlawfully pushed out of their well-deserved homes, but it is also inhumane that the people in position to make change 
tangible and meaningful assistance to our communities, do not invest in their communities, knowing what is at stake. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Pinto. Next speaker, please. Vicky, followed by Rosa Lopez, for, followed by Sandra Placencia. Hello, my name Thank is Vicky Garrido. I am an ex-employee for Superior Court. Um, I worked for them for 15 years and I have seen firsthand um, the eviction process and how many families have lost their homes to unlawful rulings within the courts. Um, just recently, I had a friend who, was, who filed for, for a response within the court system and she reached out to me to help her fill out her paperwork and kind of guide her on what to do. Um, unfortunately, it was really sad to see that Gina Cervantes, who is a court commissioner within the Superior Court who used to work with GBLA and I had contact before, do, you know, just didn't want to do her due diligence in regards on the proof of services for the people who were living in that unit. And she went ahead and ruled against the defendant and ruled with the landlord. A lot of those rulings do happen within Superior Court and it's sad to see that our justice system is not just with um, evictions, especially with what Ms. Pinto said, a lot of farm workers would come to the window. They would ask us for assistance on how to fill their pop paperwork. And us as clerks were not allowed to, were not allowed to give them legal advice. We would send them to the landlord tenant assistance center or send them to G GBLA. But opposite, the attorneys would come and ask us how to fill out paperwork or what paperwork was missing, which to me was really, um, it was really awkward to tell them, let me go ask my supervisors, and then the supervisors would tend to those attorney, attorneys. That is not the correct way to help our people who live here in Kern County. Um, the system is biased towards people who don't have attorneys. Attorneys are needed a lot for these people who don't have the legal means to pay an attorney to help them through the process. That's pretty much what I was here to say. Thank you, Ms. Garrido. And next speaker, please. We still have a number of speakers who'd like to speak, and so I'm gonna ask you to be succinct, please. Uh, good evening, my name is Rosa Lopez, and I'm a long-term resident of Ward 2. I'm a community advocate, and I'm here to ask that you listen to the community's plea and prioritize and invest in programs that will keep families housed. Our unhoused population continue to increase. The speakers pre before me have shared some data with you, and I'm sure you've seen them in the local articles. Uh, because we continue to waste funds pushing them out of our site or criminalizing them for being poor. You have tested quick fixes and added emergency shelters, cleared out encampments and policed parks, but you have not addressed the root cause of public safety concerns and the increasing number of unhoused people, like building more affordable houses, bringing industries that pay livable wage, prioritizing workforce development, creating green space, and in investing in social programs that will help our families thrive and stay in their homes. I applaud you for thinking about this crisis and naming some of the programs that already exist, but something doesn't match, right? I mean, we keep on seeing more people in the streets. Um, the, we keep on seeing more people and unhoused folks um, on the streets, and so the data and the testimonies that you've heard here tonight um, does not represent what, you're, what you've shared, that we are looking into it and we are investing in certain programs. Like others have shared, these are bandage responses. Tonight you heard from various speakers imploring you to stop business as usual and reconsider how you prioritize budgets. You have a chance to stand with the community and allocate the $2 million to the, for the eviction prevention program. Um, like the speaker said, um, this is a smart program, preventing, preventative measure to keep families in their homes instead of letting them get evicted, then hauling them around in emergency shelters. You can continue to do the same thing, um, you can continue to do the same thing and sound surprised when we see that the numbers don't match. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Next speaker, please. Sandra Placencia, followed by Wendell Wesley Jr., followed by Andrea Montero. Welcome, please introduce There's, yourself. Uh, more comment cards on the table. We are, uh, we have eight more minutes for this segment, so okay. if you can all keep your uh, comments as succinct as possible, please. 
Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, Sandra Placencia, Leadership Council. Um, just wanted to reiterate that the reason why we want the eviction prevention program is because we want accountability, and we want accountability to the bad landlords, right? And the reason why I state this is because the programs that Mr. Clegg mentioned are great, right? We all want permanent rental assistance. We want a variety of programs that are listed in the housing elements, but I remind the city that you're currently out of compliance on your six cycle housing elements. HCD has not deemed it compliant. So by that, I state that the city must invest $2 million into the eviction prevention program to help reach accountability by HCD. What I mean by this is that the eviction right to counsel program is, um, it will further AFFH, which is affirmatively furthering for housing, um, and that will give you points so you can better reach compliance and accountability by uh, the state when it comes to your um, housing element. Last thing I also wanted to mention is um, through affirmatively furthering fair housing, the city has the ability and the duty to provide meaningful and beneficial actions that will help community. And when we were working with the ERAP um, back in 2020, a lot of landlords did not want to take those rental assistance checks. So who are tenants going to call if there are no attorneys to call to force landlords to take those checks? We need accountability and we need it now and we cannot wait until the mid-year to see this happen, and the data that is gonna be collected should have been collected a long time ago. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, Wendell Wesley Jr., you all know me. Um, that registry would be a big, big deal. We need to start that like yesterday, because we need to identify all the landlords, and we can't allow landlords to hide behind three or four or five LLCs to get out of, to try to qualify for some type of program that will allow them to get free services, okay? so. Soon, and very soon, there will be a nonprofit community land trust. I'm going to urge the city council to work with that nonprofit community land trust because what the city is proposing is going to be based on a gross income, okay? And, you know, based on the income level of the low income and the low income, it's still going to be too high. You're looking at a 40-year mortgage. You're looking at a first and a second, okay? We need to start building these real, true, affordable housing, make a lot of them rentals, and make some of them actual housing and sell just enough to keep the program running. Because for the simple fact that we are so far behind right now, and because we let the real estate board run amok and keep pushing the level up in what we're causing, the median price of housing will continue to go up. And by allowing people to keep buying houses and flipping them, it's madness, okay? It's gonna continue to go up and it's gonna continue to be out of reach until we have a true nonprofit community land trust that will actually be able to afford and keep the price down for people that need it. And that, in turn, will improve situations that we have on our street. Not just homelessness, but crime as well. It's all, it's all connected. So really, we know what we're talking about because we've been there before. And I've come from a city that's been through the same thing that we're going through right now. And I know what mistakes they did that made it worse. And I see where they are now. So please, let's reach out to us and let's get this done because we are way behind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wesley. Next speaker, please. Andrea Montero, followed by Cecilia Castro. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Andrea Montero. Dear city council, city staff, and Mayor Go. My name is Andrea Montero, and I am asking the city to allocate a large investment in the 2024-2025 city budget regarding the eviction prevention program. Tenants should be given the opportunity to know their rights and have, the attorney, have an attorney represent and guide them when facing an eviction or housing issues. Uh, my family and I are actually going through the process of being displaced from our home where we grew up because our landlord is selling our house. Now, I have two options, and I appreciate Andre Gonzalez and the city manager for giving us all of these awesome opportunities. However, I cannot afford a house under the uh, loans that you guys give for first-time um, housing uh, buyers. I also don't think that the housing right now is affordable for someone who literally has a good job. Like, I don't know what your definition of affordable is because my paycheck will not be able to sustain that. I am the eldest daughter of my family. Um, I am the most eligible to have documents to buy a house, to um, 
do all of these things, and it's really difficult for me. My father passed away three years ago, and he was the one that was representing my family. Now I'm the legal guardian of my family, and I'm literally representing my mother and my two younger brothers. It's really difficult. So the city is obligated to actively promote fair housing, proactively combat discrimination, and address patterns of segregation by prioritizing the housing needs of lower income households and households with special needs. It is time for the city of Bakersfield to invest and preventalize, or sorry, um, in preventative uh, measures that will protect tenants and keep families housed. I really appreciate you listening to me, and this is all real. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Montero. Next speaker, please. Cecilia Castro. Hello, my name is Cecilia Castro, and today I'm, not, I'm here not only on behalf of the Dolores Huerta Foundation as the executive director, but also in my personal capacity, as this issue is very close to my heart. I am urging the city council to do right by its constituents and to make a bigger investment in the eviction protection program, which will protect tenants and ultimately benefit the larger Bakersfield community. We all know that there's a housing crisis in Bakersfield. I live in downtown Bakersfield and I see it every single day. We need sustainable solutions and one-time rental assistance is just, just not enough. Like I mentioned, this issue hits close to home for me. My mother, a longtime resident and renter, recently moved into a new home. Within just a few months, she encountered numerous issues, gas leaks, electricity problems, lack of hot water, and most importantly, a hostile and incompetent property management. We discovered that this property management is basically a shell company, a company that owns many properties throughout LA and Bakersfield. And thankfully, my undocumented mother had access to resources and my help and my emotional help to support her, and many others do not. It is clear that companies like this are preying on our communities, on your constituents. Out of fear of eviction, my mother had to endure numerous violations, and we are now having to seek legal counsel. But my mother's story is not unique. It is the story of many, and we really need a solution that addresses the root cause of this problem, an eviction prevention program. I appreciate uh, you know, the city manager explaining many of the programs that exist, but they are not eviction protection programs, right? So this is your choice. Will you stand with corporations and developers, or will you stand with your community? I hope that you will find it in your heart to support the eviction protection program and really stand with your community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Madam Clerk, uh, there's one more speaker that we're gonna have time for, and I'm just gonna ask you to set the clock for two minutes. Ms. Santa Maria, please. Ms. Santa Maria. Madam Clerk, may I have the speaker card? Please? please introduce yourself. Oh, good evening, Council and Mayor Gill. My name is Dominic Miller. I am a longtime resident of Bakersfield, born and raised from East Bakersfield to the Southwest Bakersfield, and I am the senior class president of 2017 Printer High School ASB Honors. I am here to speak on behalf of the Homeless Prevention Program as I have been homeless for the last couple of years due to my mother's house being taken and $10,000 of my inheritance. My experiences uh, as homelessness with landlords are unnecessary and a violations of federal housing law. Recently, uh, I know that you guys have dealt with Clement Company who were charged by the state attorney general for $93,000 for overcharging residents. My experience with them has been horrible. They are. Uh, they have tried violating federal laws by not accommodating the social security program accommodation laws in regards to federal housing. They have allowed uh, drug addictions. They have allowed rapes to happen, including myself as a victim of rape as a February at Clamor and Company. They, and I tried to um, explain to them what happened. They said, we're not responsible for your safety and quality of your living. But why do we pay rent to these landlords who refuse to help our residents and help our veterans who are homeless and help the people who are most vulnerable 
to these situations. And I do want to remind the council that I am developmentally disabled, so I've been through a lot. And I highly recommend that the council take this plea seriously for $2 million. I may be raspy with my voice here currently because I do have social anxiety and it took me a lot to get up and speak at the council tonight on behalf of the homeless population. I am a homeless advocate and advocate. And I believe in the fact that I have belief in the council and our city staff in order to help our homeless population to not be homeless because of the homeless crisis that's going on in the current state, the country, and county. Thank you, Mr. Miller, and sorry for the challenges that you faced. Uh, thank you for having the courage to get up and speak. Thank and you, now, uh, you have a great night. And, thank you. And now we're going to go to council for comment and action. Uh, Vice Mayor, if you'd like to finish. Count, uh, council Member Core. I had a request earlier, but after hearing um, just your life experiences, and thank you for having the courage to come today and speak and share your personal experience. Um, truly, it just goes to show how important programs like this are. Um, I, I know it probably took a lot to, to come and share your story with us today, and I just want to convey my immense gratitude to you. Um, and, and to all the advocates, sorry, for your mother's experience. Um, uh, these are like real experiences of our residents here in the city of Bakersfield. And um, I just wanted to share my appreciation for you coming here and sharing your own personal stories. Um, and I just hope that we can do justice to um, and working towards what, what our residents really deserve. Sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. Thank you. And uh, are there council members? Any requests? Vice Mayor. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, I think Council Member Kaur captured a lot of my sentiment as well. I just want to thank everybody for your heartfelt statements um, and just, just honest um, testimonials. Um, I, I'm thinking as I'm working here. Um, so I wanted to ask staff um, for a couple things as we look towards um, the future. Um, council member Arias made a referral at the last council meeting regarding uh, the use of ARPA dollars for uh, uh, homeless prevention funds. Um, I, I, I think that's a, it's a worthwhile, I think it's a worthy uh, use of those dollars. Um, I, I'm hoping that we can get to that particular issue sooner than later so that we can identify additional dollars either for EPP or for other really effective um, homeless prevention funds so that we can help those who are in crisis now. Uh, can you give us the timeline as, as to when staff thinks that we can bring this to the council? Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor and Mayor and Council. <clears throat> um, I would also just you know, submit that uh, the conversation at our workshop this afternoon was the first step in being quickly responsive to that request to outline uh, the homework that we feel like we need to go and do to look at the different prevention programs. That's one. Two, we have to um, share with the federal government a um, annual report on the use of ARPA funds in uh, July next month. And so in the second meeting of um, July for, for the city council, we'll have that report back to council. And I think it'll do an, one important task, which will be to highlight where we have spent the ARPA funds down, where we anticipate to continue to spend the ARPA funds down, and where really are there still funds that, are, that remain unspent. Um, um, largely, all ARPA um, funds had been at least allocated into certain buckets, um, but uh, we will come back and identify for council where we have fully expended and where we don't expect to fully expend, and then that can be an opportunity for council to weigh in on how to use some of those final ARPA dollars, and so that's just a month away, essentially, from now. Uh, probably worth, and I think the council is aware of this, but for the benefit of the public, 
we have to encumber any ARPA funding before December of this calendar year. Yeah. And so uh, we'll have to move uh, on you know, any program. And, and um, I think it's, it's um, important to consider the different uh, ideas that we put up today, even in the workshop, but also be reflective of those items that we can move quickly on versus items that might take a little bit longer that might be more appropriate from one of those other funding sources like home funds or the general fund or other you know, HAP funds, uh, for example. So uh, July, and then um, it, there could be still opportunities to revisit and allocate ARPA funds in the fall before December 2024, um, uh, but we'll come back in July and, and have an accounting of where those funds are at. Okay, and, and the, the other item uh, that I was going to mention earlier was uh, to the point that some of our um, community members raised in some letters that they had sent City Hall re regarding their concern for a reduction in the allocation for affordable housing, uh, that two million dollar reduction. I I, I want to make a referral that we uh, direct staff to look at. Uh, restoring those dollars in the next fiscal year, fiscal year 25-26, and that we not uh, continue that reduction, uh, but that we restore it back to the $5 million as we had in, in the initial PSVS budget. Um, with that, I'll move adoption. Uh, I'll, I'll move for the approval of the resolutions for fiscal year 24-25 city budget um, with the caveat that we will bring back the discussion related to the ARPA dollars for um, eviction protection, prevention programs, or other uh, homeless prevention work. Thank you. Council Member Arias. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate the Vice Mayor's questions, um, many of the same questions that I had. Um, if, well, let me, let me back up. Um, Ward 1 is home to some of the highest uh, densities of housing throughout the entire city of Bakersfield. It's also disproportionately a district where we see far more renters um, and apartment complexes of, of so many different sorts as opposed to single family uh, residences. And even those single family residences, many of them are uh, rented out as well. Um, and so I just, I just wanted to lay that on the table to say that this disproportionately impacts the constituents that I represent and, the, and, and my very neighbors. Um, and it, it, it's frustrating um, to know that as, as hard as we are working, as you know, so many of our partners continue to do the good work, whether that be flood ministries on street outreach, Clinica Sierra Vista working on the medical side to engage some folks um, out in the streets, um, as many affordable housing units that we're building. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, in a year's time from now, with this current budget as proposed, I don't have reason to believe that we are going to slow down the inflow of homelessness, right? For every six folks that we place into permanent supportive housing, 10 additional individuals fall into homelessness. We are in a game that we cannot win. And it will not be until we can actually change the way that we are playing the game uh, that we can actually expect some sort of different outcome. I don't think it's clear how tonight we do that. I think that there's no one solution that's going to fix this, this problem. There's not one single reason why someone falls or a family falls into homelessness. Uh, and in fact, you know, I love the eviction protection program. I think we have to continue to fund that program. But I also don't think that that program itself is going to prevent every single individual family from falling into homelessness. Um, and so I appreciate the vice mayor's uh, sentiments. I think we have to bring this back as soon as possible hopefully within a month's time, uh, leveraging the $2.1 million, but also potentially other uh, sources of funding as well. I know we talked about uh, many streams coming from the state and federal government that we could potentially leverage, some that we leveraged here tonight. Um, and, and the sooner that we can continue to move on, on that work, I think the better. Um, 
qu question uh, for the city manager on encumbering those funds by the end of this fiscal year. Um, I know that we've moved a bit of ARPA funding into certain buckets like the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, for instance, um, and then also the Community Land Trust. Um, those, that shifting of money, does that, is that considered in encumbrance of those funds by the federal government? Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember. The um, Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, monies that were moved from ARPA, uh, yes, uh, in part because we did that, you know, fairly early in ARPA, and we've actually awarded projects also against that uh, funding, and so we're in very good shape there. Um, for the Community Land Trust, we we um, are confident that if we can identify the funding buckets for which that will be spent. We don't have to have every project, but if we can say, you know, uh, $2.5 million is gonna go towards infill and, you know, a uh, million dollars or a million and a half is gonna go towards acquisition of a, you know, this type of property, that we, that will count as um, having encumbered it prior to December, yes. And so would the same thing apply if we were to develop a new program, for instance, hotel, motel, inspections, um, would, would that potentially also count as encumbering of uh, those funds? P potentially, let, let me also confirm and we'll, we'll probably have to get some technical assistance um, uh, to make sure that that is the case, I think. But, but in the spirit of your question, I think also if we've done an RFP process and identified you know, um, an, an entity that would be managing that or you know, you know uh, owning that contract, absolutely that would count as an encumbrance. And so we don't have to have everything uh, you know, fully expended. It's just um, the, the projects and programs uh, in the works. Um, but we'll also, we can confirm whether or not uh, an identified program um, with specific dollars for how it's gonna be spent would also qualify. Okay. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just finish my comments by saying that, you know, um, I think we recognize the urgency that we need to move on this issue. Um, I think it's clear that we're gonna have to get pretty creative um, in figuring out how we are able to uh, allocate funding uh, towards, you know, continuance of EPP, um, you know, continued rental and utility assistance. There are I think um, the presentation that was made earlier, there were at least six, six other buckets of funding that come through the city of Bakersfield that could potentially be leveraged. Um, and I say that because there are so many good things that are in today's budget as proposed that staff has worked really hard on and really diligently on. And the comments that were made tonight are not missed on me. Uh, we gotta continue to move quickly um, it's our hope that we can bring, staff, staff can bring something back, and it's my hope that the advocates can continue to come back and have these conversations um, and continue to shed light on some of the challenges that residents are having on a daily basis until we can come to some sort of resolution and make sure that we can keep families housed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. Um, am I correct that we are going to be voting on approving the budget for next year. That, that's correct. Okay, I just want to be sure, because mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions of what's in the budget. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Flake, can you tell me um, how much is in the budget for the, uh, the B3K project and the KEDC? How much money each one have we allocated in our budget? Thanks, Councilmember Freeman. Um, I'm going a little bit off of memory here, but I'm fairly certain that it's accurate. We uh, created a bucket that funds the chamber, B3K and KEDC, that's uh, about $300,000. The majority of that is for B3K. We're looking at, I believe, $250,000 for B3K and um, uh, about a, a fairly even split between the other two from the remaining $50,000. Hmm. Okay, um, you wrote us a memo a while ago explaining what B3K had accomplished this year, what, what 
which <laughs> said really hadn't accomplished much. They were looking for a director. In between the lines, it looked to me like he was sort of floundering around. Without a director, they couldn't really, an interim director really couldn't get it pulled together. I assume we spent 250000 this year, or did we not? Uh, yeah, we, we spent uh, $150,000 this last year. Um, and I made a comment that in the all of the information you gave us on B3K uh, and other stuff that that it appeared that they were making it's seeking more high tech jobs, concentrate which moved them naturally towards the Mojave and where all the high tech weapons and airplanes and everything are. And that was kind of the focus, because that is high tech for Kern County. That's all the only high tech we really have that is growth. Only bit, my observation, Bakersfield doesn't benefit tremendously. Lancaster does, maybe a little Tatchapi, but our city doesn't get, you know, they're not setting up headquarters here when they come up with, uh, you know, a new way to park planes like one of the innovations they come up with. So I was... Oh, and, and, and in all of their communications, they completely left out our biggest and only growth industry, which is logistics and warehousing. Um, and I was saying I wanted to see some, you know, that folded into their emphasis for the future. If we're going to give KEDC 50000 which is what their emphasis is, and they've actually done a reasonably good job in that, um, and if that's going to be split, the 50 to 25,000 board give 250. And I have nothing against BVK. I, we could be talking 500,000. I'm not against what they're doing at all. But I would like to see, I don't know how I vote for this, not knowing if I never got an answer. Are they, are they just saying, we're just not interested in your major industries here. We have to create new high tech, which is a great thought, but a lot of it isn't ever going to come to Bakersfield. And the job creation we need here is with the industries we have, and we're losing oil, ag is being shrunk, and we're a logistics center. That is it for new job creation. Uh, so how do I or we get that emphasis brought to B3K equally since we're giving them 80% or 75% of the money. Yeah, Councilmember Freeman, a couple of thoughts related to that. One, um, I do sit on the uh, leadership council for B3K as well as the executive steering committee. And so, um, you know, direction from council through me to B3K is, is very direct access. Uh, but what B3K is working on, uh, I think your um, assessment of what has been the biggest wins for B3K over the last year absolutely were in aerospace. That's that's accurate. But B3K does have a focus on several other target sectors. And so um, advanced manufacturing right here in the metropolitan area is an emphasis for B3K. What they're calling um, advanced uh, business services is a focus for B3K, meaning uh, that we, um, th these are, uh, for example, uh, accounts payable or IT services or HR services that could be done remotely that you know, other large corporations we're finding in some of the large metropolitan areas don't want to pay the high rents and the high wages for some of those areas. And so they're looking to sort of off, uh, not offshore out of the country, but offshore out of those cities into places like Bakersfield. That's an emphasis for B3K. The logistics um, uh, is um, less so as a straight emphasis, but m about advanced logistics, again, and those uh, higher um, uh, technical positions in logistics is a focus for B3K, as well as energy diversification is a huge focus for B3K. So what I would suggest to the council is that while we haven't made huge progress in those other sectors, it's absolutely the mission of B3K. We have received numerous grants um, uh, related to aerospace, but we did also through some of our efforts of the, the overall B3K coalition, receive grants related to energy diversification. There's been some grants to help with um, uh, carbon management um, and some other energy projects. So what we really need to do is continue to push hard to make sure that B3K makes advancements in these target sectors that are more relevant to Bakersfield. 
It is my assessment and belief that we will do that. We've been working hard in those spaces. We just haven't seen those wins yet. One example is the technology park um, that we've talked about. Um, the uh, CSUB did receive the $83 million allocation to create their energy innovation center that would then be a complement to the tech park there in West Bakersfield. And then also looking at advanced manufacturing park in East Bakersfield along the Brundage Lane corridor. So um, the, the work of B3K continues in those important areas. We just need to get to those wins. Okay. Um, well, you're our representative there. So you have to advocate for us. And I'm not saying that the people on the board are good people and aren't advocating for us. Some of them are really more in the county than they are here. Uh, but I need assurance from you, and I'd like us to sort of get a quarterly report on what are they doing for us? If we're, that's a large allocation compared to, you know, given very little to anybody else. If we're gonna give them 250,000 a year, um, I would really want your assurance that you'll be telling us and advocating for stuff here and some pragmatic stuff and not to exclude our logistics and industries that we have. Um, everything doesn't always happen in the county. Uh, so, okay, that's one caveat. I need that assurance. Um, oh, the other thing, within this budget are all of the parks, we, you know, I'm the guy who brings this up every time, are all of the parks that we have collected the majority of the fees for budget to be under construction within the next fiscal year in this budget? They are not. And well, we're putting a lot of money towards other things. Those are legal and moral obligations to the people living in the houses staring at a dirt field and they paid their money. Um, I know I'm not the guy who complains about this. What do we have to do to get at least the ones to sort of, if they paid the majority of the fees, why aren't we building their parks this year, other than if you say, well, we've started engineering design, I think we talked about one a while ago. Why aren't we doing it? I mean, why are, it isn't that much money in the 600, and it's like, what, that'd be a first priority before we did any other kind of a park. We would do the ones that the people already put their money in. So what, what do I need to do, or what do the council need to do to get these, the ones where they've already paid, not the one they, They've only collected 25%, but the ones where the majority have paid their fees or they bought their house, which had a big, massive, you know, five, 6,000 bucks in that house is for the fee for the park in front of their home. What do we do to get the parks built? So a couple of different things. First, our parks master plan update um, has been in process, which we've asked the team to come back to council with recommendations for how to get those parks done. That's scheduled for July 24th. We're gonna also come on that council meeting and provide that presentation to you. Um, my belief, and uh, we can, we'll verify this, you know, between now and July 24th is that, excuse me, the, the number of parks where, you know, 70, 80% of fees have been collected, it's actually a small number of parks. We have 11 undeveloped parks that we did make a commitment to build but for many of those, we have collected less than 50% yeah, of the no, total no, fees. Let's say there's yeah. three. Yeah. Um, so why, why can't we be reserving enough money to meet our obligation to those people? Um, I mean, we, we put estimated amounts for things we haven't bid yet in our budgets all day long. We, we, we say, hey, given what we've got, what Rick says a cost per square foot, hey, here's approximately how much it's gonna cost and we gotta chip in put it in the budget. We don't have a final engineering and bids on it anyway, but we budget for things in advance with estimates. And I'd sure like to see those three parks put in that we can certainly get them engineering started before the end of the next fiscal year. So I would agree with you that we do budget that way, absolutely. I agree with you that I think we could get the engineering and design you know, and potentially even construction in the works in this next fiscal year. I think a couple of the big decisions that were pending trying to get this back to council were that uh, our, and, and you've talked a lot about this, so there's no, no surprise to you that 
our ability to build a, a 10 acre park or a full five acre park with the fees that were collected is going to be hindered. You know, we the, the fees have been fairly flat for a lot of years. Some of these were collected, you know, before the pandemic when, you know, inflationary yeah, we're not costs. But we've had this discussion three times at council. We know that. Right. We, we absolutely know that. We might have collected half. We were remiss for five or six years not bringing the subject up, whatever. Um, I'm just saying we should be putting in this budget a plug figure on our best estimate because we're going to fund the difference, whether it ends up being an eight acre park, a seven acre park, a 10, that we put a number in there so that it's so that there is some money there once to decide how big or how will cost a year in that park. But we, you know, we can make an educated guess. I don't know if it's an extra million on each of three parks, but it's a number, it's in there, and we, you know, that way it's been budgeted so when the time comes, you can actually fulfill our obligation to these people and start construction, even if it happens in the last <coughs> quarter of next year. But at least sometimes the next fiscal year, we at least break ground on if, if it's three parks that we have, you know, basically the subdivision's finished. So, is, there is nothing we can do to get that in the budget. I, I think at this point we have probably two options, uh, and I'll acknowledge. I think I think a, a fair suggestion that you're making, Council Member. Um, we didn't do it in the proposed budget, and so we would have to identify something else to to back out of the budget to do that right this minute. The next option would be that we identify really how much we think that that would cost you know, to do those parks um, when we come back on July 24th, and then identify at some point during the year another appropriation. I mean, another time could be mid-year if we have year-end fund balance as we close the books and identify, hey, we've got two or three million dollars of fund balance that, that could go towards those parks, then we could plug that in um, um, after we close the books. Okay. But if, to do it right now, we'd have to back uh, something okay, out. Okay, then if, if you will agree that the first monies from the, the extra fund balance, you know, the stuff we really didn't spend that we budgeted that always cushions our cash reserve at the beginning of the year that can be, that can be 10 million, it, it can be substantial that at least we take the first monies from that, which will be like found money, and we apply it towards whether it's two or three, you, you tell me, the parks that really should, should have already been started and we put those in the budget at the whatever, in the revision with these monies. When we revise the budget to reflect those extra, at least we take the first, whether it is three million bucks, and uh, we pass this budget like it is, but, but that we agree that when those found monies turn up, we will reserve those to start these parks that at least two or three of them ought to get engineered and designed and get them done by the end of the year. Mr. Clark, if you just would wait one minute so our guests can leave, it I know appears are, that a number of them are trying to leave tired right of now. hearing the park discussion. <laughs> But I'm, I'm going to keep bringing it For up. For anybody else who feels like they want to leave, this would be the appropriate time so that we can continue. I'm coming back. Well, if those, nobody's here from those neighborhoods tonight, are they? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm done with my comments after this. Just... I just need a satisfactory answer here. You know what? All we got to do is let Council Member Bruce speak for a while and we'll clear the chamber. <laughs> <laughs> so, Council Member, uh, I am comfortable with that recommendation. I think respectfully, that's probably a council decision. Um, I'm comfortable to say I, I would recommend that back to the council. But if, if there's, I guess, you know, as council, as the appropriating body, you decide you know how to you know appropriate and, and spend those funds. If if there's, uh, I, I would sort of call a little bit the question if there's you know comments from colleagues who might want to you know comment on that at this time that would help staff 
know how to you know bring that recommendation back for a future appropriation, but um, I am uh, I, I I'm comfortable with that recommendation. But I would just suggest again that's a that's a council decision. Is that simply a separate motion, and don't make it part of the budget approval? One suggestion I could make is that we, we received a referral already earlier tonight to um, consider another item. You know, um, at next year's budget, we also received another referral. You know, earlier tonight to look at another item at mid-year, and so it it could be a separate motion or it could be a referral to staff to bring back that recommendation after we identify our you know uh, fund balance. Uh, okay, I'll just. To keep the budget clean, I'll, I'll make a referral. I'll make that a referral to bring this back when, you know. Once we determine the, the, um, the cushion that we had going into the fiscal year uh, for reconsideration, okay. That's my motion. Oh, that's uh, that, my wait, direction. That that's my referral. Thank you, Council <laughs> Member staff, Freeman. I don't think it needs to be to uh, a committee. I agree. We can okay. bring it straight back to Council. All right. Thank you. Council Member Arias. Thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll keep my comment short. Um, just, just one comment about the process for the budget this year and, and really you know, also applicable to uh, the mid-year budget as well. Um, I think we could do a little bit better or at least I would like to ask that we do a better job at educating this council on uh, what sorts of capital projects uh, you know are in the hopper um, you know there's just so many across the board and across departments that it's it makes it really challenging to uh, figure out you know what, what what's coming down the pipeline you know what what's you know coming up next year uh, you know is, is there an opportunity to you know, make an acquisition for uh, some parks that uh, need to go in um, as opposed to, you know, the regional park at MLK. I just think across the board, it would be really helpful uh, for us to, you know, take a deep dive at, you know, what's what's on the docket. If I may, Councilor Mayor, very happy to do that. Just clarifying, when you say in the hopper, that's, I'm, I think I'm hearing you say not just what's in the proposed CIP, but those that are just didn't maybe quite make the cut to be in the CIP, the next one's down the list in the CIP? It, it, exactly, okay. exactly. And then also to, uh, because there, there are, uh, you know, projects that, uh, you know, we, we will fund utilizing local dollars, PSVS, general fund, et cetera, uh, but then also those others that maybe, hey, we're gonna get a project into design so that we can t go after this major grant opportunity um, you know, all, all, all of that would be super helpful as part of the uh, budget conversation. Thank you. Councilmember Gray. Well, <clears throat> this is kind of a, you all have kind of given me a good segue because we're trying, we're talking about budget and where we can find money to do some of these things. And I wasn't going to bring this up after our very tear jerking uh, testimonies tonight on the eviction. <laughs> I thought, no, this is not the time to talk about this right now, but now that we've gone into this other conversation, um, I had brought up two weeks ago uh, about the 40, $49 million being spent on complete streets. And um, the next day, I believe it was, there was a big article in the, in the Californian on that that was published uh, June 12th. Um, I just want to tell you, first of all, I appreciate the breakdown because when that $49 million was just sitting there, we're going to spend it on complete streets, we had no breakdown. That's where I think we could get better before this um, budget, you know, next year so that people really understand when you just throw $49 million out there and you don't really know what it is. It helped to get that, that breakdown. And I do want to say that all the capital improvement programs um, or, or are listed in the, um, the budget that you guys gave us. So I appreciated that. Um, 
so in looking at that, um, the majority of the money was money that needed to be spent. I appreciated you told us where that money was coming from and so forth. And 77% of the complete street budget was on sidewalks. Which I'm very pleased, pavement resurfacing, stormwater management, and street lighting. That made up 77% of it. And again, I just want to reiterate, those kind of details need to come be to us way before we're going to be voting on a budget. So that's what I didn't feel good about last week. In fact, I was going to vote against the budget if I didn't get the information that I needed. So thank you for sending that. Um, however, though, um, it was reported in that same article on June 12th that um, city officials were reviewing the eventual rollout of the active transportation plan. This is where, when we're talking about money need to be found, I just hear me out on this, guys. That has made me a bit nervous. In that article, it said that all future projects, programs, and policies aimed to make it safer and quicker to travel without a car. When I read that, I thought, wow, what an oxymoron. We're going to travel quicker without a car. I don't think pushing a stroller, um, being in a wheelchair, or riding a bike is going to be traveling quicker without a car. So that, that was kind of odd to me. And so, and then another quote, it said, the aim of the plan is to offer easier access to alternative mode of transportation, bike, foot, wheelchair, scooter, stroller, skateboard, to name a few. I'm quoting, again, in the newspaper. Um, this is all coming from staff and so forth. I'm reading that and I'm thinking, aren't sidewalks meant for pedestrians, wheelchairs, strollers, scooters, and skateboards? Roads are meant for cars, not scooters, skateboards, and pedestrians. So that really puzzled me. And when I brought this up two weeks ago, I had a, a barrage of comments coming after me because I said that people, in fact, I talked to two today, um, in my constituents, in my business, that said, what is going on, Patty, with these narrowing of roads and so forth? I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But anyway, two more people today. So. On June 16th, it was reported and quoted to say, but we are trying to change habits so we can reduce the amount of people who are literally dying on our roadways. Change habits. I'm thinking, okay, change habits, move around more quickly without a car, as stated in the June 12th article. Puzzled again by that statement, when we're a sprawled city, we need cars, and and very respectfully, because I respect the fact, and Councilmember Smith is in such great shape because of it, physically, but he's the only one that I know of in this whole room that rides a bike to work every day. The rest of us drive cars. Roads are meant for cars. So change habits, who's going to change their habit? Is anybody else in this room tonight willing to change your habit and start riding your bike to work? I kind of doubt it. I'm not going to be able to do that when I'm 80 years old. You know, it's hard, it'll be hard for me now. I guess maybe if I had an electric bike. So then June the 23rd, and I'm having to take you through this because I, I need, with a barrage of um, comments that I got afterwards, acting as though I'm this horrible person because I'm not worried about people dying on our roadways or pedestrians are riding a bike. Yes, I am. But let's get this all into perspective. So in June, on June 23rd, the headline was, nearly every pedestrian killed last year was found at fault. Why? Well, according to BPD, and I assume they'd be the authority on these matters, of 28 pedestrians killed last year, 20 were found to be at fault. That mirrors the California Highway Patrol numbers, which oversee state routes and highways, concluding pedestrians have caused nearly half of recorded crashes this year, end quote. I didn't... Pull that out. It was in the same article. 
<clears throat> Traffic Commander Mitch Galland, a 26-year veteran on the force, stated that people crossing mid-block can be the deciding factor in lane blame. It's the majority of, excuse me, of the time by far. Mr. Gallon also stated that he believes the city streets are a volatile mix of harried drivers, darting pedestrians, and diverging cyclists that together routinely flout the rules of the road. When asked about complete streets program, he was skeptical. One could have all, one could have all the crosswalks, barriers, and partitions in the world. There's no simple solution for stopping pedestrians or cyclists from shirking the rules and getting hit. If we build the bike lanes and they don't use them, then what? Yes, Council Member Smith, I know you're following the rules and I know you're using the bike lanes properly. Most people are not. So he goes on to explain that law enforcement has the inability now not to be able to enforce or punish jaywalkers because of Governor Newsom's known uh, assembly bill as Freedom to Walk Act. I thought, well, that's a really interesting title for uh, jaywalkers. Now they have the Freedom to Walk Act wherever they want to go. So you'll never change people's habits to reduce the amount of people who are literally dying on our roadways, no matter how much traffic calming you do when people are not following the roads. And then a consultant, and this is why I'm bringing this up now because this ties into the conversation we've been having. A consultant with Kimley Horn, Mr. Darrell Phillips said in the same article, June 23rd, so I'm not going to lie. This is going to be an expensive plan to implement active transportation um, plan. He says it's going to be an expensive plan to implement. There are a lot of big investments, I believe, that are needed that we've talked about on this dais tonight. We have got a lot of stuff facing us in this city. And we're talking about this expensive plan to, to put this together. I don't get it. I don't get it. I just don't get it. So all the information from these experts is exactly why I'm again spending millions of taxpayer dollars on narrowing the streets, jamming up traffic when the roads were meant for cars. It is these types of policies that are a waste of hard earned taxpayer dollars that are driving our constituents right out of our city. Good tax paying people, we meet them every week in our business that are leaving the country. They want to remodel their bathroom or kitchen so they can sell their house and leave them out the country and leave the state into other states like Texas, Tennessee, Florida, Idaho. So I do not believe as a city we can afford to throw money away when there are so many other ways to spend our dollars as in towards our neighborhood sta stabilization programs our parks that people have already been talking about tonight. We heard testimony after testimony tonight. I mean, two out of seven of us visibly showed their heart and their tears for the people that are coming forward, and I was holding my back. So I'm saying to all of you, and, and Council Member Freeman, he was quoted in that same article as saying, it's going to be like a cold shower dealing with budgets as all the subsidies dry up one day. So I would ask the staff to reconsider the high cost of your active transportation plan that is going to cost millions of dollars into the future for this city when we have basic needs, basic things that need to be taken care of, and we're thinking about some of these crazy ideas. And we may get in so deep into that thing that we cannot deliver on the promise. So that's my comments tonight. Thank you. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I just obviously need to respond to a few comments. Um, roads are meant for cars. Roads are meant for people. Roads are meant for the public. Uh, you said yourself, sidewalks are okay. Well, sidewalks are a big part of it. Streetlights are okay. Well, streetlights are a big part of it. A complete street isn't when we first build 
24 feet of paving and it's only built for cars. A complete street includes sidewalks. It includes drainage, which was another 20% of the 49 million. So I don't know, you like street lights? I mean, that cuts down on crime. It, it makes streets safer for everybody. You like sidewalks, that makes things okay. Everybody likes storm drain. Flooded streets are unsafe for everybody. If it's the 2% that's going for the bike lane, I'm sorry. You know, that's just 2% two percent, two percent for the bike lane. That's too much. I, you know, I'm with you. Those people should die. But the, you know, people driving cars, 10,000 red light stops and stop sign citations we gave the last time I could get in a year. 10,000 people driving cars. 31 people died in cars without any pedestrians or bicycles involved. We need to build our streets differently. That's what we're talking about. We need to make our streets safer for everybody. That's what we're talking about. Thank you. Councilmember Kaur. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to echo Councilmember Smith's sentiment. Roads are for people. The city is for people. The parks are for people. And if we, are, just yesterday, a devastating accident happened where a pedestrian, we don't even know, we don't even have the report back from our authorities who have been doing the investigation. It didn't feel urgent enough for us to have a report back to know what exactly happened and how someone yet again lost their life just using the crosswalk. If, if we can talk about $2 million being, if, if we can say something and go as far as saying $2 million is a huge amount of money when we are still reading headlines about someone who lost their life and residents have been reaching out to so many of us who were literally trapped at nearby gas stations because of the investigation going on and who were looking at a pedestrian, the pedestrian, the cyclist, their body is in the road. This is on Stockdale Highway. And I know we have a lot of conversations about where uh, these accidents are happening and pedestrians being at fault. Let's not remove the fact that the geography of that is always kind of an undertone as to how we're placing value on people and who's in the streets and why they're walking and why they're cycling in the first place. This is also a class conversation to be had. But when, uh, when it's also in, uh, in every part of town, it's in every district, it's in every ward, um, I guess we're also failing to talk about the parts of this same article when residents also uh, shared their own personal experiences of just walking. There was a list, a grocery store list of items that somebody was going to the store to just obtain and uh, didn't even feel safe enough to do that. There was a young woman talking about her grandfather who cycled and we're talking about if anybody in this room is going to cycle back and forth to work, uh, this, is not the, this is not representative of our whole city or the, the residents or the population. We saw people leave who had other commitments, uh, who have to go take care of their children, feed their children, have to go, get up and go to work today, uh, who can't even watch us uh, pass the budget because, because of the time that it's taking. We're also talking about the people who can't make it here today. It, it is the elderly, it is the children who should be able to safely cycle to work. Councilmember Smith is one of the best examples and who is so inviting and encouraging of how to practice uh, cycling safety. But for a child who should be able to cycle to school safely, who uh, should be able to walk to school safely, how are we thinking about them in this equation? Because I have had children l lose their lives to speeding vehicles in my ward. So I can speak to that and families who are still grieving to that. And I know I'm not unique to, in that experience. Uh, the elderly man mentioned the article. That was also in my ward. That is an elderly man who cycles to the park every single day, who cycles to his place of worship every single day and has the same route. Was it his fault that there wasn't a bike lane on the right side of the road? 
Um, no, that is an infrastructure issue. That is an infrastructure gap, and that is our fault. That is our responsibility. In order for someone who is not able-bodied, who uh, is, is is chooses to cycle, but also uh, a vehicle is not their primary mode of transportation for whatever reason, for age, and they are over 80, and they are staying active, so why are we preventing them from having that ability to also uh, engage in whatever form of mobility that they seek? He was hit by a car, and it wasn't even a speeding car. Somebody was turning right at a stop sign, and he was hit, and his blood was splattered in the road. Um, that is traumatic. He now has moved back to India because of how unsafe he feels. That is mentioned in the article. So I think we also need to look at the full picture of this, of what it is forcing our residents, what decisions they're making. Our local news agencies are reporting of how many unsafe accidents we have had, how many fatal accidents we have had, how it is only increasing. We, we get the, uh, the press releases from the BPD every day. And almost every day, you can expect a fatality of a pedestrian or an accident that involves a pedestrian or a cyclist. So if we cannot take the responsibility and invest funds, there are many competing priorities clearly for our city. But I don't think we can reduce or deny the fact that this is not a meaningful investment. This is something that is causing people to lose their lives. People are dying in our streets as Councilmember Smith has said. This is like any other crime. This is like anything else. It should be taken with just as much seriousness. And I just, it's shocking that we have this conversation so often. All it takes is reading some of our local news media to know what the state of affairs are in our city. Vice Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I know folks want to go home, but th this, uh, comment by Councilmember Gray deserves a response. Yes, roads are for people. Someone just died in the crosswalk on Stockdale and Allen last night. Three people have died in the last week in Kern County. People trying to get around, people on bicycle, people walking, people using walkers, people using wheelchairs. Having a car is a luxury. Not everyone can afford to have a car. How do they get around safely? How do they get around? How do they travel to work? How do they travel to school? How do they travel back home? How do they go to the grocery store safely? They have to cross the street somewhere. And what we're proposing is that we create infrastructure that it's safe for all users. There's three ways to look at this issue. We can, number one, we can blame the behavior. Number two, we can blame the lack of education enforcement, which in the article we saw some folks do. And number three, we can address the root causes related to design of roadways. So let's talk about behavior. We often talk only about pedestrian behavior, those who are walking and bicycling, but never, we never have any regard for those who are driving vehicles and their behaviors. When we know and we hear from constituents that people are driving too damn fast in our neighborhoods, that we know that people are more distracted than ever using smartphones and smart devices, we know that people are buying bigger, heavier vehicles which are deadlier, and so the combination of factors of bigger vehicles moving uh, moving faster by drivers who aren't looking at the roadway is a deadly mix, deadly com combination. But those are behaviors we never often talk about. And there is a study that just came out from Smart Growth America called Dangerous by Design 2024. Bakersfield. Mr. Clegg, what is Bakersfield ranked in the nation in terms of population? Number 57? We are 47. 47, okay, thank you. Number 47, you know where we rank in terms of uh, pedestrian fatalities? Ranked per 100,000 people? <coughs> Any guess? You know, I'm, I'm Number four. I'm Number four, 3.99 people have died per 100,000 from 2018 to 2022. We rank number four in the country. San Francisco. San Francisco 
because oftentimes people like to blame this on those who aren't housed, which is unfair. When we take a look at homelessness, San Francisco ranks number one in the country in terms of homelessness, 959 people per 100,000. You know where they rank in terms of dangerous roadways and pedestrian fatalities? Number 63. There are cities who have actually fixed this problem. Um, the city of Jersey City, New Jersey. I met the woman who's actually a head of transportation just a few weeks ago. In, before two, 2022, the 10 years prior to that, 20, 2012 to 2022, they had over 100 people die on their streets, walking and bicycling. In 2022, they were able to bring that number to zero. How did they do it? It was by design, by rethinking how they designed their roadways. And so roads are for people, and we have to accommodate all users of our roadways so that we can meet the needs of our constituents, particularly given the fact that we are number four in the country when it comes to pedestrian fatalities. I am so tired of watching the news and seeing another pedestrian fatality and mourning the loss of an individual who has died on our roadways when we could have slowed traffic down by design. Councilmember Gray. I'm finished with my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, don't see I will other... say this. I do want to reiterate the fact that where these are facts are coming from came right out of our traffic division in Bakersfield. So I do, they are the authority, and I think the facts speak for themselves. You have a motion? Please catch your votes. Motion is approved with Council Member Weir absent. Thank you. Next item, please. Council and Mayor statements. I don't see any requests to speak yet. Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I just, uh, tonight we voted to approve a bicycle and pedestrian facility that I have been working on since I got on the council 12 years ago. And I just wanted to thank staff for continuing to work on it. It was not easy and it took a long time and a lot of agencies and a lot of people and, and now we're gonna actually construct it and cobbled up the money from a lot of different places. Uh, it's a great expansion of our existing Kern River Parkway that is east-west, and it, it will run five miles north from about Coffee and the existing bike path and go all the way to city boundary at 7th Standard Road and will serve that northern part of the community well. So thank you, staff, and uh, look forward to riding on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Councilmember Core. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, very exciting news, Councilmember Smith. Congratulations. It's a long 12 years of fighting. Um, today we passed our budget for the 2024-2025 fiscal year. Uh, we are the ninth largest city in the state of California, and I think that's uh, a long, hard uh, kind of planning process, so I just wanted to thank staff for working so diligently and taking all of our ideas and and, and working, um, you know, your, your very best to have seven competing priorities, uh, as well as everything you hear from the community. And um, I know there's clearly, as we've discussed even today, there's a lot of work yet to do. Um, but we've created some meaningful community-based programs. And it's always so encouraging to see when community-based organizations or individuals bring forward ideas that allow for us as a city governance to, to be able to partner and, and create something meaningful. So 
I want to thank everyone for uh, for working towards that. And um, just a little shout out: we have um, one of our local journalists who is leaving our great city of ba of Bakersfield, John. Uh, John, you've done such a great job reporting on the city, and uh, local journalism is incredibly meaningful. And it's something I cherish. It's something I've always cherished, no matter which city I've lived in. Um, but the Bakersfield Californian host holds a really special place in my heart. My mom made sure we read the Californian every single morning before school. It was our routine. We all sat on the countertop, and we passed the different slips of the Californian around. Um, and that was our routine. That was our every morning. So you've spent meaningful time here. We hope you'll visit, and we'll hope you'll return. Um, thank you for reporting on our city and, and doing justice to a lot of meaningful causes, including the article on um, just asking a lot of important questions around pedestrian, bicycle, and road safety. Um, I know that is something folks are going to sit with for a long time. And as the conversation kind of alludes to today, hope it brings some meaningful change. And you had a big part to do with that. So I will always cherish and appreciate local journalism. So thank you for contributing to that as well. So we'll miss you. The city of Bakersfield thanks you. Thank you, Councilmember Kaur. Councilmember Arias. Thank you, Mayor. Also want to echo those same sentiments to John. Thank you so much for your, your, your fair reporting. Um, and uh, just want to commend you uh, there were many uh, rather chaotic moments in this, these very chambers, and uh, John, you were there through all of it, um, whether you liked it or not. <laughs> and we appreciate that, and uh, just wish you well on your journey uh, forward, and uh, know that you'll always have a place here in, in Bakersfield. Um, with that, I also want to acknowledge the fact that we will have someone else departing um, the city of Bakersfield. Uh, Mr. Chris Boyle um, was just informed that tonight may be his very last night um, here with us at a council meeting. Um, and I just want to say thank you, Chris, for everything that you've done for the city of Bakersfield. Uh, we know it hasn't been easy. Um, I'll, I'll recall the very first meeting that I had with Chris uh, in his office. Uh, he said, I have one request of you, uh, council member. And I go, well, what is that? And the ask from Chris was that you always come to me and get my side of the story. Um, and uh, I, I hope that I've held true to that commitment. Um, and I uh, just want to say thank you uh, for all of the tremendous work that you've done um, and, and has, have started with the general plan, um, an outrageously high arena number, uh, working closely with developers in Ward 1 uh, to make you know, things happen when it comes to housing development, commercial development. Um, you know, we wish you could be here as, as we uh, hopefully eventually approve the Habitat Conservation Plan. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us in the audience as we make that happen. But just want to say thank you. And uh, I know that you've left your department uh, in, in good hands. And uh, the city of Bakersfield is better because of you. So thank you. I don't see any other requests. Happy 4th. Uh, have a safe 4th. And we stand adjourned at 753.